I'd like to introduce Dr. Juan Uria Greca, who will be introducing Dr. Chomsky. Come in, come in. Yeah, sure, come in. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, since we uh, took so, uh, so long to organize, and this is a self-organizing crowd, a promise that a better society is possible. <laughs> I will just cut to the chase. Um, rapidly, um, there will be a, a talk on uh, March 1st by David Simon, uh, creator of The Wire, another one of these conversations. Uh, Angela Davis will be here on April 18, uh, 5.30 as well. Uh, actually, uh, she will be in this room, uh, and David will be in uh, Gilderhorn recital. Um, the format of today's talk, Noam will give his talk, and then um, there will be microphones in the middle, so try to line up, etc. cetera. Uh, Norbert, this guy over here, big guy, uh, is going to sit here, and they'll chat, and you will get your chance. So um, I could tell you a million different things, but look. If uh, you are in this place and you don't know who Noam Chomsky is, you're not just in the wrong talk, you're in the wrong planet. <laughs> so um, uh, let's just go directly to him. Uh, it's to me, he's a dear friend, dear mentor, uh, inspiration beyond belief. So welcome Noam, it's all yours. I've uh, been asked to uh, offer some personal reflections about uh, several notions, uh, grammar, mind, and body. And uh, being obedient by nature, I'd <laughs> like to comply, but it's, and I'll try to do so, but it's not easy. Uh, one reason is that I'm skeptical about the status of all three of these concepts, at least as they're conventionally understood. So I'll try to explain why and then go on to say a few things about how I think they can be uh, usefully reconstructed. So take the first, grammar. Uh, I'll keep here to common and traditional usage. Uh, a grammar, a descriptive grammar, is supposed to be an account of a language or maybe a text that you can use to learn the language. Uh, grammars of that kind go back to classical antiquity, and they contain a good deal of information and uh, a lot of insight. Uh, but they can't come close to being actual accounts of a language for a very simple reason. Uh, nowhere near enough is understood. Uh, for the same reason, uh, a theory of any other complex system, say the, the visual system or uh, um, insect navigation or whatever you want, is bound to be incomplete. Uh, to understand the nature and the workings of uh, such systems is always a very hard scientific problem, very far from being resolved. It's interesting uh, that it's often assumed to be straightforward in the case of language, not in the other cases. Uh, so we constantly hear that a strange failure of modern linguistics is that it hasn't provided a complete grammar of any language, complete theory of any language. Uh, one doesn't hear uh, uh, claims that modern science has failed because it hasn't provided a complete account of the mammalian visual system or of uh, the navigation system of uh, bees or something like that, uh, or anywhere near it. And I think there's a reason for the distinction, and it has a long history, in fact. It goes back to a belief, uh, actually dogma might be better, uh, that the workings of the mind have to be transparent. Uh, for contemporary philosophy, it's often a definition. Uh, something is in the mind, if and only if you can, uh, it's, a, it's accessible to, uh, uh, to introspection. Uh, understandable doctrine, but completely untenable. Uh, it, it was thought traditionally, you go back centuries, that uh, 
the study of psychology and the mind would be much easier than physics because it's all open to you. All you have to do is look. You know. Well, you can learn a lot about a language from a traditional or a uh, pedagogic grammar, uh, but the reason for that is that you already know the answers uh, to the most fundamental questions. And you know the answers because you're a human being and you have uh, uh, the human language capacity, uh, which enables you to, uh, it's what enabled you to acquire your language in the first place from scattered and complex data. And it can help you uh, use the data, more or less organized, maybe presented in something that's called a grammar of the language. It wouldn't be too far from the mark to say that grammars are uh, collections of idiosyncrasies, the things you, you can't know just by being human. Uh, so you have to pick them up from uh, data. Uh, it's uh, in a rather similar way. Uh, if you have, a, say, a manual for teaching tennis, it won't go into uh, the instructions that you send from your you know, motor cortex to your arm to uh, lift up the racket. And uh, a theory of uh, motor organization is not going to care uh, how you get your ball past the opponent on the first serve. Uh, and in general, the scientific theories are almost complementary to the uh, manuals of instruction. Uh, they deal with different things. And what you don't care about uh, for the uh, manual instruc of instruction is exactly what you do care about for the scientific theory. And something like that is true also with regard to the, what's called the grammar of a language and what a, uh, a linguist interested in the nature of the language or language generally would uh, be interested in. So take one other example. There's a, one of the more interesting uh, discoveries of perceptual psychology not too long ago is uh, Shimon Ullman's rigidity principle. Uh, what this means is if a subject is shown several presentations of a few points of light in sequence, what the person sees is a, uh, is a, a rigid object in motion. Uh, the constructed image is just produced reflexively on the basis of inner resources, but the person who sees it hasn't the slightest idea of what they're doing or how or why. And similarly, uh, no grammar of English, uh, what is called a grammar of English, I'm not talking about a scientific grammar now, but what's called a grammar of English, it doesn't even try to account for innumerable, uh, very elementary facts about language. So, let's give you a couple of examples to make it concrete. So, take the sentence, uh, he wondered if the mechanics fixed the cars. You can ask how many cars and uh, how many mechanics. That's respectively uh, how many cars did he wonder if the mechanics fixed or how many mechanics did he wonder if fixed the cars. Well, think about those. The first of them expresses appropriately the intended thought, but the second doesn't express the intended thought. There's no problem with the thought, but the language is so constituted that you just can't express it in a simple way. The language design requires you to construct some more complex circumlocution. Well, gr what are called grammars of English don't deal with matters like that, uh, let alone try to explain them. And for someone who's trying to learn English, that's no problem at all, because they already know the answer, uh, just as the person who's uh, learning to play tennis doesn't have to be told how to send signals from the motor cortex to the arm, uh, the, uh, or say to follow the, the trajectory of a ball. That's part of your nature. Uh, and uh, uh, similarly, a person doesn't have to be taught how to perceive a rigid object in motion, even when there's no object and there's no motion, you perceive it anyway, uh, cases I mentioned. Well, take, a, take an even simpler example. So take the very brief sentence, can eagles that fly swim, and ask what it means. Uh, it asks whether the eagles can swim. It doesn't ask whether they can fly. Uh, similarly, we can say, are eagles that fly swimming? 
which means is it the case that eagles that fly are swimming but we can't say are eagles that flying swim meaning is it the case that eagles that are flying swim now again the thought is fine it's a fine thought I just expressed it the proper way but the language doesn't allow it to be expressed without a complex circumlocution uh, and again there's no problem for the person learning English uh, because the human language capacity reflexively yields that result just as it determines uh, that you see a rigid object in motion and of course grammar books don't try to teach you anything like that they just confuse you if they did in fact nobody even noticed it uh, well it's uh, in fact if you think about it the facts are kind of puzzling uh, in each of these two in these sentences let's say are the are again are eagles that flying are are are, uh, are eagles that fly swimming are eagles that swimming fly the verb at the beginning the verbal element at the beginning has to pick up a verb inside the sentence to be associated with and it doesn't do it the easy way the computationally easy way would be just pick up the first one uh, then you would say are eagles that flying swim which expresses a, could express a fine thought if the language allowed you to say it uh, and that's computationally simple you just run through the sequence of words find the first one, verb that's the one you attach it to but you don't do that you do something much more complex you have to determine the structure of the sentence and then find the main verb and that's a computationally complex task but that's the way language works and uh, uh, we would for the science of language you'd like to understand why it necessarily works that way and there's some pretty good reasons well puzzles like that are all over the place in fact if you open a book at random you'll find plenty of them and uh, a language has been studied very productively for literally for millennia back to classical Greece and India uh, but until the dawn of modern linguistics about 60 years ago uh, things like that were never even noticed and it's not surprising uh, we know the answers instinctively so for practical purposes it's quite unnecessary even to notice the facts or to try to understand uh, how language works apart from scientific curiosity that is and it's much the same as in visual perception and much else and a further reason is that scientific curiosity is not so easy to arouse uh, most of what's happening around us it just seems obvious so you don't seek to explain it of course through the ages inquiring minds have <coughs> sought explanations and we have names for those those quests we call them a religion or myth or magic or in an organized more organized and systematic form we call them science uh, there was a substantial leap forward in uh, scientific inquiry particularly from the early 17th century it's often called the Galilean revolution and an important part of uh, that leap that move forward was uh, uh, the recognition that things that seemed obvious were in fact very puzzling uh, like the example that I just mentioned so uh, for millennia uh, take suppose for example that I'm holding a a cup in my hand and there's boiling water in it and has a cover if I take the cover off the steam goes up and if I let it go the cup goes down so why does the steam go up and the cup go down well there had been an answer for millennia literally they're going to their natural place end of story steam goes up cup goes down uh, Galileo and others of his period allowed themselves to be puzzled about that actually really the first time and uh, when they allowed them to be puzzled they found that it's not obvious and first of all all your intuitions about how it works are just wrong as soon as you begin to investigate it well that uh, willingness to be puzzled uh, is typically a first step towards understanding uh, if you don't just say look it looks obvious uh, finished uh, then maybe you get some understanding well efforts to solve the puzzle the kind that I just mentioned puzzles about motion 
they led to a mode of explanation that was given a name. It was called the mechanical philosophy. Philosophy just meant science, so mechanical science. Uh, the mechanical philosophy had a goal. It wanted to dispense with the kind of mysticism of uh, the neo-scholastic uh, uh, ph science, philosophy, uh, forms uh, fl flitting through the air, uh, uh, sympathies and antipathies, uh, other occult ideas. And it wanted to keep to what is firmly grounded in common sense understanding and intelligible to common sense understanding. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, there was a conception. The conception was that something is intelligible to us if you can give an account of it in terms of a mechanical construction, where mechanical means the kind of thing that a skilled artisan could construct. And that's what the world is, something that, in fact, a super skilled artisan did construct. So now we have to give explanations in terms of uh, mechanical constructions that we can uh, provide. Uh, all of this was uh, stimulated by uh, the technology of the time. Uh, this is a period when there were you know, very complex mechanical clocks being made or uh, uh, models of uh, a duck digesting or uh, uh, the gardens, the royal gardens where you could walk through and uh, voices spoke to you and f statues stood up and all kind of amazing things happened. Uh, in fact, the, the stimulus of the artifacts of the time is not unlike the stimulus today from uh, uh, what's done by computers. It kind of stimulates the imagination and can lead you astray in both cases. Well, the mechanical philosophy, the mechanical science, uh, provided a criterion of intelligibility. Uh, if there's no mechanical explanation, there's no understanding. I'll quote one of the leading Galileo scholars, Peter Machimer. He says that by adopting the mechanical philosophy and initiating the modern scientific revolution, Galileo had forged a new model of intelligibility for human understanding with new criteria for coherent explanations of natural phenomena uh, based on the conception of the world as just an elaborate machine where Again, machine means something that an artisan can construct. And uh, for Galileo, and in fact other leading figures of the early scientific revolution, uh, a true understanding requires a mechanical model. That's, a, again, a device that an artisan can construct and we could take apart, so intelligible to us. Uh, Galileo uh, tried throughout his life to achieved this goal and mostly failed. Uh, he rejected traditional theories of the tides because he said we cannot duplicate them by means of appropriate artificial devices. And at the end of his life, his inability to find mechanical explanations for cohesion, attraction, other simple phenomena, it led Galileo to, quote him, to reject the vain presumption of understanding everything and even worse, he finally concluded, there is not a single effect in nature such that the most ingenious theorist can arrive at a complete understanding of it, meaning an intelligible account in mechanical terms. Actually, that turned out to be true in a deep sense that he didn't anticipate. Well, scientists didn't give up at that point. The founders of modern science continued to try to seek intelligible explanations. Uh, the most famous and important was Descartes. He's thought of as a philosopher. He's primarily a physicist and biologist and so on. Uh, he, uh, you know, no distinctions among the sciences in those days. Uh, he believed that he had succeeded. In fact, he claimed to provide a mechanical account of all phenomena in nature, almost. He noticed that some aspects of the world remained recalcitrant. Uh, in particular, human higher mental faculties, what Aristotle long before had called the rational soul. And the uh, facts that, uh, the case that Descartes found most convincing uh, was uh, normal use of language. 
what's sometimes called the creative <coughs> aspect of language use. In normal language use, uh, we produce new sentences freely and without awareness of any novelty. Uh, they are not caused by situations, circumstances, but they're appropriate to circumstances, which is a crucial difference, not understood, but a, quite a crucial difference. Uh, there, uh, it goes on indefinitely, there's no limit to it. Uh, they're intelligible to others who uh, realize that they could have expressed the same thought themselves. Uh, and uh, this a collection of properties, uh, Descartes argued correctly, in fact, uh, lies beyond mechanism. Now, in the substance philosophy of his day, that many, uh, he, he then followed normal scientific principles. And uh, here's something that doesn't fall within uh, mechanism, so we need a new principle, kind of a creative principle. And in the substance philosophy, that meant that we need a new substance. We need what was called the thinking substance, race cogitans, which is alongside the extended substance. Uh, substance is just something that can exist independently of other things. So we have a, uh, a material substance, extended substance, and then we have a thinking substance. Uh, that's, and then the next problem is to find out the properties of the thinking substance, the properties of mind, and to show how it links to the other substance, to the material world. Actually, he explored those topics. Some of it survives, not much, so we don't know exactly what he achieved because he destroyed a lot of it uh, after he learned about the fate of Galileo. He was worried about it. Uh, so we don't really know what a lot of what he said or found, thought he said. Well, uh, uh, there were... Uh, uh, this uh, imposed a lot of other tasks, incidentally. Uh, a very serious problem that arose right at the time was that this was the rising period of empire, and explorers were finding all sorts of strange creatures, like orangutans and, and Native Americans. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't obvious which of them were humans. And it was extremely, it's an extremely important point, uh, because... If you're human, you have an immortal soul. And if you're not human, you're a machine. So it's quite sig it's significant to determine uh, which of these creatures are, fall into which category. And there's a great deal of debate and discussion about this. Uh, my favorite, uh, uh, actually, the, uh, my fav uh, well, there is a very good uh, Descartes scholar, uh, late Harry Bracken, now, he presented some quite interesting arguments that uh, these so-called rationalist assumptions uh, provided a barrier against racism. You couldn't be a rationalist and a racist because you either have a soul or you don't have it. You can't have half a soul. So there's no gradations among humans. There's just a break between humans and machines. Uh, well, given the crucial role that language played in these concerns, it's, uh, uh, there was another crucial question. Do these creatures uh, have a language like ours? And there are a lot of debates about this. Actually, one of my favorites was a suggestion by uh, Louis Racine, son of the playwright. Uh, he suggested that apes, he had a proof that apes are really more intelligent than us. And the reason is they don't talk <laughs> because of, <laughs> And, and there's a reason for that, too. They know that if they did talk, we would enslave them. So they keep quiet. <laughs> uh, more seriously, Descartes' followers, so-called minor Cartesians, uh, devised uh, interesting experiments to try to determine if some other creature uh, has this capacity, has the linguistic skills. Uh, these tests, which are kind of interesting, are precursors to what today is called the Turing test, named after one of the great uh, 20th century mathematicians and computer scientists. Uh, the Turing test is generally regarded as a test uh, to determine whether a machine can think. Uh, Turing himself dismissed 
the question of whether a machine can think is, in his words, too meaningless to deserve discussion. It's a short paper, eight-page paper he wrote, which is the basis for all of this, and that's one line in it. Unfortunately, nobody paid attention to it. And the failure to pay attention to his conclusion, I think, has led to a huge amount of uh, wasted effort and discussion. Uh, but it's enough to point out that the rather similar 17th century precursors were dealing with a much more serious, who gave you know, complicated tests, kind of, of the Turing test type. Uh, they were dealing with a much more serious issue, uh, not just how to apply the word think, but what are the constituents of the world? It's a metaphysical question. What's the world made of? Well, the framework of uh, early modern science did give rise to a significant and meaningful mind-body problem. So the material world could presumably be explained by mechanical science, but there are aspects of the world that could not, like creative aspect of language use, so you have to postulate mind, uh, soul, same thing, uh, alongside of body, and investigate its nature and investigate the interactions of the two systems. Uh, this point of view, this kind of picture, uh, has a, it does accord pretty well with our kind of common sense picture of what things are like. Uh, and uh, it, of course, has much earlier origins. Uh, in different terms, the Galilean Revolution took the long tradition about these, of these debates and uh, it, it reconstructed it within a serious scientific framework, at the same time laying the basis for modern science. Well, um, unfortunately, it didn't last very long. All of this was shattered by the end of the century. Uh, Isaac Newton, uh, much to his dismay and disbelief, uh, refuted the mechanical philosophy. That's what his great work was. He showed that nothing falls within its range. That is, there are no machines. There's nothing physical. There's nothing material. Uh, even the most elementary phenomena of nature, uh, uh, the planetary orbits, uh, the motion of the tides, uh, can't be explained in mechanical terms. So to account for the phenomena of the world, it's necessary, he showed, to appeal to uh, what were considered occult forces, uh, the same kinds of uh, mysticism that early modern science tried to expunge, you know, uh, sympathies, antipathies, and so on. Uh, it was necessary to appeal to mysterious forces of attraction, repulsion, and the like, uh, which are literally unintelligible as intelligibility was understood, and also as intelligibility is understood in terms of our common sense understanding. Uh, Newton regarded these conclusions, his own conclusions, as an utter absurdity. So absurd, he said, that no serious scientist could entertain them for a moment. And in fact, he spent the rest of his life uh, trying to find a way around the dilemma. He failed. Uh, many other great scientists of the day and later tried as well, uh, also failed. Uh, finally, the task was just abandoned. It was never solved. It was abandoned. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, and with the abandonment of the task went the only coherent notions of machine, matter, uh, body, physical, any of that array of concepts. So the standards of intelligibility for science were lowered. Uh, instead of trying to find, to, uh, to, uh, the, uh, to develop a, an in, uh, intelligible theories of the world, an intelligible account of the world, the task of uh, early modern science, uh, there's a much more limited goal, uh, namely to develop intelligible theories, theories that we can understand, even if we can't understand what they're about. Uh, and that's actually modern science. That's a far different matter from early modern science and a much more limited goal. And I think this should be regarded as a very significant shift in the history of thought. Uh, by the time we get to the modern thinkers, people like, say, Bertrand Russell, who knew the sciences very well, the modern sciences, uh, he dismisses the very idea of an intelligible world as 
his words an absurdity. And when you read what he writes about this, he constantly places the word intelligible in quotes to highlight the absurdity of the quest. Well, though Newton himself regarded his great conclusions as uh, an absurdity, uh, others understood uh, that they had enormous significance. Uh, David Hume <coughs> described Newton in his History of England as uh, the greatest and rarest genius that ever arose for the ornament and instruction of the species. His greatest achievement was that while he seemed to draw the veil from some of the mysteries of nature, he showed at the same time the imperfections of the mechanical philosophy, and he thereby restored nature's ultimate secrets to that obscurity in which they ever did and ever will remain. That's a pretty far-reaching claim, and I think an accurate one, uh, but very commonly denied. Uh, it's commonly claimed we can understand everything if we just try. It was understood in the 18th century why that can't be true. Well, there were other leading thinkers at the time who reached somewhat similar conclusions, sometimes on different grounds. Uh, John Locke, uh, for example, he observed that motion has effects which we can in no way conceive motion able to produce, as Newton, in fact, had demonstrated shortly before. And so he went on, since we remain in incurable ignorance of what we desire to know about matter and its effects, therefore no science of bodies is within our reach, and we can only appeal to the arbitrary determination of that all-wise agent who has made them to be and to operate as they do in a way wholly above our weak understanding uh, to conceive. That's Locke. Uh, well, if you, apart from the uh, kind of resigned uh, invocation of the deity, the conclusions are now commonplace among serious historians of science. So Alexander Quare, one of the leading modern historians of science and physicist, uh, he pointed out that uh, Newton demonstrated that a purely materialistic pattern of nature is utterly impossible and a purely materialistic or mechanistic physics is utterly impossible too. Mathematical physics requires the admission into the body of science of incomprehensible and inexplicable facts, facts in quote, suppose, imposed upon us uh, by what we observe and discover. Well, what then happens to the mind-body problem? Uh, there's a standard contemporary view of this. It was articulated clearly by the influential uh, Oxford philosopher uh, Gilbert Ryle in his famous book 60 years ago uh, called Concept of Mind. If I can add another personal note, that was virtual Bible when I was a grad student in philosophy at the time, Penn and Harvard. Uh, Ryle dismissed the concept of mind as uh, with ridicule. Uh, he assured us that modern science had gotten rid of the mystical belief that there is what he called a ghost in the machine, you know, a mind inside the machine, just the machine, no ghost. Well, what had actually happened was almost the opposite. Uh, Newton had exercised the, the machine. He didn't touch the ghost. He left the ghost intact. So Descartes' work on the mind was untouched and undisturbed by Newton's critique. But his mechanical account, account of what was considered the physical world, uh, that was demolished. And not just his account, but any possible account, because he showed there is no physical world. Uh, so there can't be any improvement, at least as the concept physical, material, you know, collection related concepts, at least they were understood in early modern science, which is pretty much in accord with intuition. Uh, furthermore, these concepts have not been replaced by new notions. So we're still in the dark about what any of them mean. Uh, they're used, so people talk about physical, material, and so on, but they're kind of honorific terms. Uh, they refer to whatever we take seriously uh, uh, to, in our efforts to understand the world, uh, just as we sometimes talk about the real truth, you know, not implying 
that there's some other kind of truth. It's uh, now often remarked that 20th century physics compels us to accept notions that are hopelessly counterintuitive, uh, curved space-time, uh, quantum entanglement, uh, beginning of time, much more. But the fact is that the fundamental problem goes back much earlier, goes back to the early days of modern science, as was very clearly understood at the time and later forgotten, as the absurdities were just kind of absorbed into our familiar science. Well, as Locke and Hume and others recognized at once, uh, intuition and common sense understanding are not reliable guides and in fact can leave a, lead us completely astray. And furthermore, with the collapse of Cartesian science, that's science as it was understood in the modern period, it came to be understood that in empirical matters, we cannot hope for certainty, only plausibility. So we search for the best account we can, uh, we can find. We know that however well confirmed it is, it may turn out to be wrong. So there are no firm foundations for empirical knowledge, no foundationalism of any kind. That was understood in the 17th century. And since it was so well understood then, I must say I find it a little odd these days to read critiques of foundationalism in contemporary literary theory and uh, cultural studies as if such a position uh, could be upheld. Uh, it can't, uh, at least in the empirical world. It's been known for centuries, um, maybe in mathematics and logic, but even there it's understood that uh, the reach is very limited. Well, with the mach machine exercised, no more machine, uh, what is there to say about the ghost? Uh, Locke actually had quite a sensible proposal. It's known as Locke's suggestion in the history of philosophy. You simply have to assume that the constituents of the world, whatever they are, have the capacity of thought alongside of other capacities that are unintelligible to common sense understanding, like action at a distance, action without contact. Now, the way Locke put it, back to the theological framework, uh, just as God had added to the world inconceivable properties of motion, he might have super added to the world a faculty of thinking. Uh, this is Locke's idea of thinking matter. It was pursued vigorously through the 18th century culminated in a quite sophisticated work by a great chemist philosopher, Joseph Priestley. Uh, he developed in some detail his conclusion, I'll quote him, that properties termed mental reduce somehow to the organical structure of the brain. Uh, that similar conclusion had been stated by Hume and others, later by Darwin, uh, and it's almost ines inescapable uh, after the collapse of uh, uh, the mechanical philosophy, mechanical science. Uh, it's, uh, well, you, if you, to restate Locke's conclusion without the theological trappings, uh, explorations of the mental aspects of the world should proceed alongside of exploration of chemical, um, optical, mechanical, and other aspects of the world. It's only in this sense that the concepts of mind and body and matter uh, remain, as far as I can see. Uh, well, there has been a persistent goal of the general project of the sciences, and you can ask why, but it is a persistent goal to try to unify inquiries into various branches of science to show, to take what has always been the most crucial case, to show how chemistry and physics are related problem that goes back centuries. Uh, it was, uh, it's, it, it, throughout this whole period, it was taken for granted that this unification of chemistry and physics uh, would uh, have to proceed by reduction of chemistry to physics. That is, by showing that the laws of chemistry uh, can be expressed in purely physical terms, in terms of physics. Uh, well, uh, no way was ever found to do this. And well into the 20th century, that was interpreted as, uh, by the most prominent scientists as showing that chemistry isn't really 
a substantive science. It's just a mode of calculation. Uh, it provides merely classificatory symbols that summarize the observed course of a reaction. It's quoting a standard contemporary history of chemistry. Uh, America's first Nobel Prize winner, the 1920s chemist, he dismissed talk about the real nature of chemical bonds as what he called metaphysical twaddle. They are nothing more than a very crude method of representing certain facts uh, about chemical reactions, a uh, mode of representation only. And the reason is they can't be expressed in terms of physics. In 1927, Bertrand Russell observed, quite correctly, that chemical laws cannot at present be reduced to physical laws. The phrase, at present, because he took for granted that the explanatory gap, as it's called in the philosophical literature, uh, would be overcome as understanding proceeded by reducing chemistry to physics. Well, that belief proved to be incorrect. The chemistry was never reduced to physics. And the reason was that the physics of the day, the 1920s, was wrong. Uh, it was soon radically modified by the quantum theoretic revolution and at that point a virtually unchanged chemistry was in fact unified with the new physics. But that's not reduction, that's unification, something quite different. If you look at the debates by leading scientists and philosophers about the status of chemistry as recently as 80 years ago, they're strikingly similar to debates today about the status of uh, mental entities and properties. So some argue commonly that the principles of mind and the entities postulated are modes of representation only and will not be part of science until the crucial explanatory gap is overcome by reducing the theory of mind to the neurosciences. There's a kind of standard slogan uh, philosophy, psychology, that uh, the mind is just the neurological at a more abstract level. And so we'll, we'll get it down to, we can explain it in uh, neurophysiological terms. And uh, today, right now, you read of the thesis of what's called the new biology, that things mental, indeed minds, are emergent properties of brains, though these emergences, emergencies are produced by principles that we do not yet understand. I'm quoting distinguished neuroscientist Vernon Mountcastle. He's summarizing the uh, guiding themes of uh, the decade of the brain, the decade that ended the 20th century devoted to the brain, and that's what they finally concluded. Well, the phrase we do not yet understand, it might well suffer the same fate as Russell's similar com comments about chemistry 70 years earlier. Uh, other prominent contemporary scientists and philosophers, quoting, have presented essentially the same thesis as what they call an astonishing hypothesis of the new biology, a radical new idea in the philosophy of mind, the bold assertion that mental phenomena are entirely natural and caused by the neurophysiological activities of the brain, uh, opening the door to uh, novel and promising inquiries and a rejection of Cartesian mind-body dualism and so on. In fact, all of these reiterate in virtually the same words formulations of centuries ago uh, after the traditional mind-body problem became unformulable uh, with the disappearance of the only coherent notion of body, physical, material, and so on. Now, for example, Joseph Priestley's conclusions in the 18th century, which I quoted before, virtually the same words. Uh, the, uh, the, today's repetitions of the conclusions of uh, two centuries ago have much less repetition, uh, justification, for one thing, because they're repetitions. You know, they're saying the same thing. Uh, another is that their forgotten precursors had a basis for their beliefs, a solid basis. 
namely Newton's demolition of the mechanical philosophy. And another reason is that you'd think that we ought to be able to uh, understand that reduction is just one form of unification. Uh, surely, after the recent history of chemistry, well, let's turn to the modern study of language during the past 60 years, sometimes called the generative enterprise. It's actually recapitulated a lot of this history without as much awareness as it should have had and should have today, in my opinion. So much as in the early days of the modern scientific revolution, the generative enterprise began with a willingness uh, to be puzzled by what appear to be simple and obvious phenomena, uh, like the examples I mentioned earlier. And it was very quickly discovered, just as in the early scientific revolution, that these are all over the place. And uh, uh, that's almost always the case if we allow us ourselves to be puzzled by what seems to be simple and obvious. Uh, I think it's fair to say that 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 step, that willingness to be puzzled, uh, is uh, the op it's what opens the door to a serious inquiry that goes beyond the surface, uh, just as it did in the early modern sciences. The generative enterprise also adopted Descartes' observations about the creative aspect of language use, at first without awareness, uh, since the history of these matters had long been forgotten and when even mentioned, was just typically dismissed as old-fashioned mysticism without understanding it. Uh, the, uh, actually, even the scholarly literature is pretty scandalous, I have to say. The, uh, the generative enterprise took as its primary task to discover the mechanisms that enter into this remarkable ability, creative aspect of language use, which does seem to be one crucial foundation for what distinguishes humans from other organisms. Uh, notice that the discovery of the mechanisms, uh, it's a very challenging scientific task in itself, but even if you discover them, which is a long way off, that would still leave us very far from understanding how they're put to use in a creative way. Now, that's a question that's barely even on the horizons of inquiry. Uh, well, thanks to discoveries in the formal sciences, logic and mathematics, that were just coming to be understood 60 years ago, it was possible for the first time to develop quite substantial proposals to show how the design of language could satisfy, might satisfy, some fundamental conditions that trace back to classical antiquity, uh, such as the fact that language somehow links sound with meaning, and in fact does so over an unbounded range. Again, a very obvious fact, which doesn't seem to have been recognized for centuries. In fact, until the early modern scientific revolution, I can't find any reference to it, uh, primarily by Descartes, but also indirectly by Galileo shortly before him. Uh, this means that every uh, language has, must be, consists of a finite, it's in the brain, a finite computational system that yields an infinite array of structured expressions, uh, each of which provides instructions for other organic systems. Uh, the sensory motor system for externalization as sound or sign or some other modality. Uh, and the uh, uh, the systems of thought, uh, interpretation, planning, and the like. Well, by now a fair amount's been learned about how such systems are constituted and how they function, and most important, about the limited range of options that the mind makes available, and even sometimes why there are such limits. Uh, these are results that, I won't go into it, that provide some solutions to puzzles of the kind that I mentioned at the outset, uh, which again are all over the place. Well, there are many further tasks. One is unification with the brain sciences. That might turn out to be reduction, although very few people should be surprised if the course turns out to be rather like chemistry. It's worth bearing in mind that 
physics a century ago was way more advanced than the brain sciences are today, and yet it had to be radically modified uh, before it could be unified with chemistry. <clears throat> now, there's quite important work underway in neurolinguistics. It's a difficult, promising field, but I think that few doubt that unification is a pretty remote prospect. Well, still another task is to inquire into how the language capacity might have evolved. Uh, oddly, now, this is a very popular topic. There's a flow of books and articles pouring out regularly. And it is very odd, if you think about it, for many reasons. Uh, one reason is that far simpler questions are barely studied because they're understood to be much too difficult. Uh, for example, the uh, evolution of the varied uh, communication systems of uh, hundreds of species of bees. Uh, a second reason why it's odd is that the methods of evolutionary biology are not available in the case of language. You can't do comparative work. Of course, you have no fossil record. Uh, that's been forcefully argued by prominent evolutionary biologists who are just ignored. Uh, another even more fundamentally reason why it's odd is that the evolution of some system, say, call it X, any system X, it can proceed only as far as you've told us what X is. Okay, so you can't study the evolution of the eye if you, if you don't know what an eye is. That sounds kind of simple. Uh, but if you take a look at the numerous publications, the real libraries on evolution of language, they, don't even, they almost barely try to say what language is uh, beyond the most superficial aspects. In fact, a careful look shows that with very rare exceptions, they're not even studying the evolution of language. They're studying the evolution of communication. The speculations about the evolution of communication, totally different matter, and though I won't pursue it here, I think there's good evidence that communication is a secondary aspect even of language use and not a significant factor in language design. Well, despite these problems, I think there's at least something to say about these matters, and we can hope that in the future there will be more if uh, the topic is seriously pursued. Well, another topic, uh, in this case very actively and productively pursued, particularly in the past few decades, is acquisition of language. How does a child acquire its language? It's actually quite a remarkable feat. There's a lot to be puzzled about there, too, only barely beginning to be investigated. Uh, even the very first stage is remarkable. So think of a newborn infant. It's immersed in what uh, William James famously called a blooming, buzzing confusion, just a mass of unorganized data. Somehow, the newborn infant manages to extract out of this confusion data that bear on language, of course, reflexively and almost instantaneously. In fact, in part, prenatally, we now know. Uh, how that's done is largely unknown, and it's only very recently even become a topic of study. It seems pretty clear that it's not a property of the human auditory system. And one reason is that other sensor, sensory modalities seem to work just as well. Uh, another reason is that it's recently been discovered that uh, a higher apes appear to have essentially the same auditory system as humans, uh, even attuned to the same uh, phonetic features that enter into human sound systems. But they don't detect anything about language, of course. So there must be some form of internal computational processing involved uh, from the very first instant. And the course of growth and development from that point on uh, also are quite remarkable when studied closely, as has been done in recent years for the first time. Okay, well, I'll have to stop at that point. It should be obvious that this is only the bare sketch of some of the prospects for the study of language, mind, and body as they're reconstituted. Uh, if we pay some attention to what has been discovered in recent centuries, and if we pursue uh, John Locke's modest ambition, quote him, 
uh, to be employed as an under laborer in clearing the ground a little and removing some of the rubbish that lies in the way to knowledge. Okay, so we're going to take questions for a half hour. Uh, I think there are two sets, two microphones here. If someone wants to ask a question, please line up and I'll call you on you to please speak clearly into the microphone because, uh, so everyone can hear. Okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, can everyone hear me? I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so, as I understand it, um, you were talking about Locke's modest, uh, modest proposal to, as I understand it, answer the hows of, of life and not necessarily the whys. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a departure from what a lot of us uh, think of that science can really do for us, you know, tell us everything. And I think um, what, we've, what you've discussed kind of shows us that we can't know everything from it. So I'd like to, you know, ask what you personally take from the study of science. What is it really worth to you, and why do you do it? Well, first of all, it's, uh, you're quite right. It's very commonly believed that uh, we can, in principle, understand everything. Uh, there's, I can give you references if you like, but it's a very standard thesis in the sciences and in philosophy of science by leading people. And it's a very strange thesis because it was understood centuries ago that it can't be true. Uh, Hume's, all the people who make these statements also worship David Hume as one of the kind of founders of modern thought. But he very clearly pointed out, as I quoted, that uh, while Newton did remove some of the mysteries of nature, he left other mysteries uh, in uh, a state where they will always remain mysterious to us, and he had reasons for it. Um, often it's argued that uh, on evolutionary grounds, uh, we have simply evolved so that we can answer every possible question. Uh, that's part of you know, natural selection, selected us to answer questions. I mean, that goes back a long time. Charles Sanders Peirce argued that. Uh, and all the way to the present, but it's totally crazy. I mean, hunter-gatherers did not evolve to solve problems of mechanics, you know, or let alone quantum theory. Uh, so there's just nothing to that. Uh, and that's what we're stuck with. There are things we can understand. Uh, there are limits to understanding. And we, can, we might even, in principle, discover what the limits are. I mean, it's not contradictory. It's hard, but it's not contradictory to think that uh, inquiry into the nature of human intelligence might explain why it can it, it deal with some things and not deal with other things. I'd like to take a crude and oversimplified, but maybe not false example. Uh, we can, humans can deal with determinacy. You know, a lot of science deals with determinacy. Can deal with randomness. There's a lot of work on randomness. Uh, but maybe there are things that don't fall within randomness and determinacy. Like, for example, the creative aspect of language use, uh, which doesn't seem to be determined by circumstances and obviously isn't random, but is appropriate to circumstances and is understood to be. And what that gap is, is pretty obscure. We recognize it all the time, you know, but that doesn't mean we can understand it. Maybe it falls beyond the bounds of human science. Well, that's possible. Yeah. But, uh, and incidentally, this extends to choice generally, not just to, that's dramatic in the case of language, that was Descartes' point. But, uh, so what's the point of science? To understand as much as you can. We want to understand as much as we can about the nature of things. That seems a worthy objective. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Mr. Chomsky. What a pleasure. Um, so 
I know a few languages, and one of them is uh, American Sign Language. And uh, you were talking about infants, and it's been shown that even before they can develop the ability to speak, they can actually learn to sign and understand quite a few signs. So I'm wondering, how does sign language factor into this? Have you, I mean, when you study languages, and, and so when you're fluent in a language, I find that when I don't think, I can sign more fluently than when I actually try to think and formulate what I'm trying to say. So how does that factor into it? Well, let's uh, I'll go back with another personal reflection since I was asked to do that. Where this stuff all began about 60 years ago, uh, there were, it was actually th three students at Harvard, three grad students, who didn't believe anything that was going on uh, and uh, started trying to think about alternatives. One was Eric Lenneberg, who went on to found Biology of Language. Uh, we were all friends. Uh, Eric uh, started studying uh, things. He, he actually he was interested in uh, the language of the, uh, the linguistic uh, achievements of people, kids were, uh, who were d uh, deaf and blind. So he went to the Perkins School of the Blind, famous school in, in Boston where they teach uh, uh, deaf children uh, uh, language. At that time and for long afterwards, even still today often, there was a very strict oralist tradition. You had the children who were deaf had to learn to lip read they were not allowed to learn sign. And the logic was that if they didn't, if they learned sign, they wouldn't be able to integrate into the general community. So the teacher would, you know, be drilling the kids in uh, lip reading. And Eric noticed that as soon as the teacher turned to the board, the kids would start going like this. Um, they'd obviously invented a sign language and were communicating with each other in sign but when the teacher wasn't looking. You're familiar with that phenomenon. But, uh, and uh, it was kind of left hanging for a long time, but in the last, uh, since about the 1980s, there's been serious study of it, and it's been discovered that uh, a sign language is just another language. So for example, at my department at MIT, there's a course on uh, what's called exotic languages, meaning anything but Indo-European languages, and it's kind of meant in quotes. And one year, a couple of years ago, they just used sign language. It's just another language. The acquisition is very similar to spoken language. Uh, the, uh, um, to the extent that the, the, neuro, the brain aspect, the brain's, you know, the neural aspects are understood, it seems to be the same, which was a big surprise. It was assumed by most people that uh, sign language, that signing would be uh, mostly in uh, tech, you know, be registered in the right hemisphere because it's visual. But it turns out it's in the left, left hemisphere, same place as spoken language. So there's some kind of analytic system in there somewhere that doesn't care what modality it comes in. And some of the things are uh, pretty amazing, but by now it's just another language. So there's nothing more to say. Mm -hmm. Over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, Incidentally, there are many sign languages. Yeah, quite a lot. It's not just one language. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so one question I had was, uh, you talked very briefly at the end about um, sort of the difference between the general study of communication and uh, just language. And so for those processes that you would you know, associate with actual true language, um, how separable would you consider those from just the uh, general cognitive machinery that goes behind the, the way that we interpret what? the world? Cognitive the uh, cognitive machinery. Yeah, you know the yeah. overall sort of cognitive framework. You know, if you had some uh, machine, say, that was able to produce models of sensory data and uh, try to communicate them, would you expect some sort of, you know, are there certain inevitabilities to the language process in terms of useful transmission of information, or is it hard to say? It's like saying, um, um, why do we assume that there's anything special about the visual, visual system? I mean, suppose we have the mammalian visual system. I mean, after all, if we had some computational mechanism that was able to construct uh, models based on data in the world, uh, why shouldn't it behave like the mammalian visual system? 
course, the insect visual system doesn't, you know. And uh, uh, it's kind of the same with language. I mean, it's, uh, incidentally, what you're saying is a very common belief. Ver again, like in the cognitive sciences, uh, I wouldn't say it's an orthodoxy, but it's very commonly believed that there can't be anything special about language. It's just a collection of uh, an array of cognitive processes. You go back about 60 years and the same view was held. Uh, language is just uh, a set of behaviors, like all other behaviors. At that time, it would be by, you know, developed by conditioned response and so on. And now it's by uh, whatever cognitive processes are around. Well, you know, it's, it's conceivable, uh, just like it's conceivable for the visual system. It's kind of interesting that it's not entertained for the visual system. And the reasons for not entertaining it are at least as strong in the case of the language system. I and mean, if it's just a set of cognitive processes, then why doesn't an ape do it? You know, they, they have cognitive processes. Um, it, it's not the input system, because they have pretty much the same input system. For a long time, it was thought that it's because they don't have an articulatory system. But the work on sign shows that that can't be right. The apes can sign. They just can't do anything with that data. They're not designed for it. Uh, just as uh, we can't carry out the kind of navigation that, a, that an ant can, we're not designed for it. Uh, so yes, you can, I mean, the thesis is common. As far as I know, it has no evidence for it. Uh, and it's highly unlikely. Uh, it's, uh, if, uh, unless you believe uh, what Louis Racine said, that apes can really do it, but they're smart enough not to because they know we'll enslave them. I can't think of any other argument. So, but yes, it's common. Uh, but, the, but there's not much point proposing. It's common in the cognitive sciences, and my, my view is it ought to be eliminated. I mean, if you can show how some capacity can be developed by general mechanisms, great, we'll all be excited. But just to say, well, maybe they can, uh, I don't see any point in that in any aspect of biology. Thank you. Over there now. Hi, Mr. Chomsky. Um, I'd like to touch on uh, just kind of going back to what he said about the difference between communication and the study of language and how you think, because um, as I understand it, some neurologists believe that a lot of emotional communication comes from kind of a musical expression in the right brain, while more uh, database communication comes from language in the left brain. How do you think your concept of language explains how language can um, express emotion in communication? Well, you know, it's, it's another dogma that language and communication are about the same thing. But if you think about it, it's extremely implausible. Uh, for one thing, you, almost any behavior you carry out uh, uh, communicates something. A gesture, a hairstyle, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost anything. So sure, language behavior also communicates something. Uh, first of all, beyond that, um, almost all language is not involved in communication. And we all know that. I mean, you can't go one minute without talking to yourself. I mean, it's, it's, it takes a tremendous effort of will not to be doing whatever you're doing when what's go going on in your head. Well, that's plainly not communication. You're doing it yourself. That's about 99.9% .9 of the uh, use of language. Now, in fact, when you really think, it's never been investigated. But if you introspect about it, it could be investigated seriously, you know, from kind of third person point of view, but it hasn't been. so. You can only sort of think about it yourself, but uh, I can only tell you my introspections. You can figure out yours. But my introspections are that when I am thinking in language, it's not really language. Uh, there's just like a, a, an occasional word will flit along, and I know what I want to say, and then I can express it somehow, some, sometimes, either internally or externally. But if, if it's the same for you, then that suggests that there's some kind of language use going on in there that isn't even using uh, uh, the uh, ar articulated language system. And it's just kind of hovering in there somewhere. Occasionally bits and pieces come out. And if you try, you can say them to yourself or say them outside. <laughs>
and you know when you get it right, uh, which means that you must have meant something, and uh, the articulation that you produce can match what you meant, but what you meant is in some internal language. And, I, uh, and uh, furthermore, even if you take a, if you look at the part of language, very small part, that's external, you know, like what we're doing, a very small part of that is communication in a serious sense. I mean, a lot of it is just setting up social relations, uh, telling jokes to your friends, you know, passing time. I mean, it's not communication in a meaningful sense of the word communication. So I think it's just a big mistake to identify communication with language. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for coming here, Dr. Chomsky. It's an honor to have you. Um, you talked a lot about the, the limits of our understanding. Um, and I was, I was curious about, we believe the connection is between our limits of understanding and as far as human happiness goes, specifically, do you feel that it's antithetical the more that we understand to, to us to be happy, like on an existential level, um, is, is hedonism not compatible with us being comfortable w with our existence? I mean, I mean I, like, is, like, is hedonism necessary rather than interrogating nature as, as far as it can possibly go? Well, I think these are really important issues that have to do a lot with our lives and the way we act, but, you know, they're way beyond the bounds of scientific inquiry. We can reflect about them, and think about them, maybe clarify some of the ideas that are involved in them, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, science can deal with simple things. It doesn't get anywhere when you get to more complex things. It's, it's hard, you know. It's even hard to deal with simple things and try to explain them. And when you do, you find all sorts of surprises. Like, for example, you find that uh, our only intelligible concept of the world is wrong. Yes, returning to the issue of language and communication, it seems, to me anyway, less likely that the statement you made would be true, that 99% of, of language is, in fact, not communication. Um, and that might be the case today, but I would see that more as kind of a, a social by byproduct, that um, maybe we have more time for introspection. We live in a society where speaking is, I guess, less common, less necessary. Um, but it seems, however, that language would have developed specifically as a means of communication, and that earlier humans in whom language was developing wouldn't have spent, would have spent more time speaking to each other, because it seems like that would be one the the most instant form of interaction and entertainment, mm -hmm. and there'd just be less time for introspection. So I just wanted to see how you would feel about we that. We have uh, hunter-gatherer tribes. As far as we know, they're just like us. Uh, remember, language hasn't evolved at all for 50,000 years uh, since humans left Africa. A small group left Africa, spread all over the world, and we're all basically identical. If you take a, an infant from an Amazonian tribe that hasn't had hum, other human contact for 20,000 years and bring it up uh, in Baltimore, it'll speak straight Baltimore English, uh, end up here studying physics, you know, uh, and conversely. So there doesn't seem to be, I mean, there are individual differences among humans, but there don't seem to be any significant or almost detectable group differences. So nothing's happened for about 50,000 years. And if you go back about 50,000 years before that, there isn't really any evidence that there was language. I mean, in that, you know, of course, we're beyond, as I said, you don't, you don't, have, you don't have comparative evidence, you don't have fossil evidence, uh, but you do have uh, artifacts. And in fact, there was a big kind of creative explosion that took place um, somewhere in that window, let's say maybe 35,000 years ago, a sudden explosion of uh, symbolic representation, uh, complex social structures, uh, 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 observations, apparent observations of astronomical events, uh, all kinds of things just suddenly happened. Uh, in general, it's usually assumed, you know, we don't have direct evidence, that this must have been connected with the sudden emergence of language. And notice that it's very sudden. 
in evolutionary times. Now, you can double or triple the numbers. It's still a flick of an eyelash in evolutionary time. So somewhere in a very small window, something happened, and then nothing happened afterwards. That part we're pretty, pretty sure of. Well, what would have happened? Uh, whatever happened, uh, unless there's some mechanism that biology hasn't discovered yet, uh, whatever happened would be some rewiring of the brain, some mutation that caused a rewiring of the brain. And that rewiring of the brain would have given this mechanism, this computational mechanism that allows these things to happen. But a uh, rewiring of the brain, a, a mutation takes place in an individual, not in a group. Okay, that's obvious. So this happened to somebody, you know, some person in some small hunter-gatherer group uh, underwent this change. That person had the capacity to do what we all do internally, but without the uh, externalization because there was nobody to talk to. You know. So there's no reason to think it was externalized at all. And just that uh, whatever is going on in our heads that is pre-linguistic, that we get bits and pieces of it when we think about that would have been available for one person. Well, you know, uh, if there's any selective advantage to that, say, ability to plan and so on, it could have been, it could proliferate in a small group there over generations. It could be enough people who had that, so it would make some sense to interact. But then uh, at that point, you, get, you would get externalization. But externalization is a very tough process. Um, there's this internal thing in the head uh, which developed without any external pressures, okay, because there were no selectional pressures on it, almost by definition. So it's kind of like a snowflake, you know, something that just develops because that's the way nature works. Uh, you have this thing in the head, you have a sensory motor system, which has been around for hundreds of thousands of years and has nothing to do with it, and you have to match them up. That's a complicated process. And in fact, that's where, practically, as far as we know, that's where all the com almost all the complexity of language is. And when you learn a language, that's what you learn. Uh, a child who's acquiring a language, that's what they acquire. Uh, uh, it, nobody teaches you. You don't learn the kinds of things I've mentioned at the beginning, which are probably just part of the way the snowflake works. Uh, so it would, and then, of course, once you have the externalization, you could have some kind of communication. So, you know, even from, a, from the minimal evolutionary speculation, and of course it's all speculation, it looks like a plausible scenario. It incidentally has looked that way to some of the leading evolutionary biologists too. It's hard to think of an alternative, in fact. So yeah, it, it does kind of sound intuitive that you know, people ought to be communicating all the time. What else do they need language for? But like a lot of obvious things, when you look at it, it just doesn't seem to be true. I don't want to have to do this, but I think we're going to take two more questions because we're running up against time constraints in this room. So one and two. And I'm sorry to disappoint the rest of you, but that's the way life is. OK, one. Um, again, I wanted to uh, thank you for coming today. It was very informative. Um, I had another question about when you were talking about the limits of the human mind. Um, I study environmental science here, and outside of any of my science courses, one thing I've kind of taken from that is that there's, to me, I don't really believe in a limit to what we can do uh, to become a more sustainable people of humanity. So to me, I really don't see a limit in the actions that we can take towards that. And I've kind of applied that to other things in life that really, as humans, we don't have a limit in what we can do. So when you said that there, that you, there might be some sort of limit to the human mind, uh, my first thought was, I, I don't like that in a degree. But um, as I thought about it more, I thought it was an incredibly good point. And um, I started to think more about like if the actions we take are necessarily completely limited by what our mind can do. And basically what I'm trying to ask is, if there is a limit to that the human mind can do and can comprehend, does that limit human action, both for right now and in the future? Well, we're assuming no evolution, you know, that we say this organism, 
not some other organism. And the time scale of evolution is too long to worry about. We'll have destroyed ourselves before that. So assume that we stay this organism. We know perfectly well there are limits to what we can do physically. Like we can't fly like eagles, say. Okay, and uh, if there are also limits to our cognitive capacities, that really shouldn't surprise anyone. It would just say we're biological organisms, not angels. Uh, furthermore, instead of being unhappy about it, you should be happy about it. Uh, because if we weren't constrained, suppose there were no constraints on intelligence, uh, it would be as if there were no constraints on physical growth. If there were no constraints on the way a fetus could develop, uh, you couldn't get any organization or structure. You get some kind of amoeboid creature that couldn't survive or do anything. And it's exactly the same with cognitive capacities. If there were no constraints, you couldn't learn anything, you couldn't acquire anything, you couldn't discover anything. You'd just be flailing around randomly. So we ought to be very happy that there are constraints because there's kind of a logical connection between a scope and limits. If you don't have limits, you also don't have any scope. You can't, same with you know, physical growth. It's because the fact that there are certain limits on what you can be enables you to become what you did become. If there weren't any limits, you know, you know a germ cell could grow anyway. You'd be anything, nothing. No. Last question. Uh, hi, Dr. Chomsky. Thanks. I'm a um, English as a second language teacher, and I was wondering what you think about this pertaining to second language acquisition, like language versus communication. And with your first language, it's really easy to know when a person knows it. It seems like one of those obvious and simple things. But when would you say somebody knows a second or third language? I mean, is it when they can communicate, or can they say ungrammatical things that a native speaker wouldn't say, and they still know a language? Well, first of all, it's very hard to know what uh, say, an, a, 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 a child knows in his first language. It's very hard to discover. I mean, it turns out that kids know uh, a great deal beyond anything they're exhibiting. Uh, that's been shown over the years of study of child language acquisition. Uh, the, uh, and we don't know exactly how much it is, uh, but certainly uh, an infant knows far more than anything it's exhibiting. You can show that by careful experimentation. Uh, Lila Gleitman and Penn, other people have done this. And there's even some evidence. It's, it's not very powerful, and you can't really investigate it any further, but there's some evidence that by the age of about you know, maybe 18 or 20 months, a child may know virtually the whole language. Uh, the reason for believing that is cases of the Helen Keller type. Uh, Helen Keller uh, got perfect fluency, you know, extremely fluent. Uh, she uh, lost sight and hearing at about 20 months. And uh, she invented for herself, we now know, this is a recent discovery from old pictures and videotapes. Uh, she had discovered for herself a method of teaching the deaf-blind that was later invented and used for teaching the deaf-blind. It's called Tadoma. It's a system where uh, the person puts their hand, their hand on somebody's face like this, and the fingers feel the, you know, the motions of the facial musculature, and the thumb feels the vocal cord. I mean, that's a minuscule amount of information, but it's enough to uh, acquire, in Helen Keller's case, uh, essentially perfect fluency. Well, that's been studied a little now, systematically, and there aren't a lot, there's an inter some interesting results have come out which haven't been published uh, because there aren't enough cases. Actually, my wife was, did the main work on this uh, at MIT. The, the, there are, uh, they have found that they have pretty, there are cases of very great success for uh, uh, people who lost sight and hearing roughly about Helen Keller's age, uh, but uh, not uh, at about, uh, not, say if it was 16 months when they lost it, they get no recovery. Now, there aren't a lot of cases, so you can't be sure.
and uh, fortunately, there aren't going to be any more cases. This was all spinal meningitis, which is now curable. Uh, but uh, you know, that's what it looks like. Uh, there may be more indirect ways to investigate it, but it's at least suggestive that uh, children, very young children, have a tremendous capacity, and there's experimental evidence for it. So I wouldn't say that in the case of first language learners, we know what they know. We don't. Um, we, uh, it's, it's hard, like most of these things. In the case of second language learners, I think there's a practical question that concerns you. What are you trying to achieve in second language acquisition? If your goal is to uh, get them to be able to communicate, well, of course, you'll test ability to communicate. Um. Thank you very much. Yeah.